without further ado, everyone, please join me in welcoming Sir Peter Ratcliffe. <laughs> Well, thank you, Peter, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'm going to tell you the, the, the story, a rather chaotic story, of our research in the laboratory on cellular oxygen sensing over 30 years now. It is a molecular talk, I'm afraid, so if you're from the history faculty, uh, it, it may not be all you want. Uh, <coughs> There are some funny moments, and I'll try and share those with you and, and give you a historical perspective. Uh, since we're in Oxford, um, I, I want to begin the story of oxygen sensing in Oxford. Now, in the, in the 19th century, the broad way the body worked had become uh, apparent. We had Claude Bernard's uh, views on physiology and... Uh, an obvious thing to study uh, was adaptation to, to unusual environments, and it was the altitude physiologists of the late 19th century uh, who described the thickening of blood at altitude, and uh, that was eventually worked out to be an adaptive phenomenon. But um, I'm going to attribute the, the, the start of, of this particular story uh, to 108 years ago thereabouts, to Haldane's famous expedition to Pike's Peak. Haldane had had a, 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 a try at altitude in Ben Nevis in Scotland. Some of you know that mountain. It's not very high. It rains an awful lot, and uh, they broke a lot of equipment, made no useful Im uh, measurements, and decided on Pike's Peak, uh, where there was a nice hotel uh, <laughs> at the top of the railway line to, to get there. Um, <coughs> But um, the heroine of, for this story was, is Mab most Mabel Fitzgerald. Now, at that time, as a woman, she, she was not allowed to be a member of the university. Um, and the boys began to get uncomfortable that she was unchaperoned in this hotel. So what did they do? Uh, they sent her off on her own. Uh, on a mule to wander up and down the hills and, and make, this is what she made, the beautiful measurements, the haemoglobin concentration at different altitudes. You know, to be clear, this was the Wild West. She survived those uh, mining towns w without the chaperone uh, and made the measurements that established the order, extraordinary sensitivity of, of haemoglobin concentration to oxygen on, on which this work is based. Uh, it turned out that that was due to the regulation of erythropoietin, and as you'd heard from Peter, I'm a nephrologist, the kidneys make erythropoietin, <coughs> and that that's was what drew me to the subject. There was a, a lot of other evidence. Uh, of course, uh, the body has to deliver oxygen to the respiring tissues, and it's beautifully adapted, and the, these are some of the anatomical manifestations that your body's organized around the delivery of oxygen to respiring tissues. Those we, though these are uh, dynamic, uh, the sensitivity that Fitzgerald established was, was not noted for these uh, other adaptations. And broadly speaking, uh, physiology concluded um, that this was uh, somewhat private to the regulation of EPO and, and the hematocrit. Um, an important um, people were asking why, why, you know, why did you decide to do this? The, the bold answer is um, it was a lucky choice. I, I, I thought the answer was guessable. I, I, I thought there would be an answer, and, and part of the reason for that is is on on this slide. Uh, ancient literature, again going back to the 19th century. Uh, established that uh, cobalt was associated with uh, erythrocytosis. The causality of that, uh, shown uh, with beautiful clarity but dubious ethics here, <laughs> by the infusion of cobalt into consenting volunteers in, in a hospital uh, with, for patients with serious psychiatric disorders. 
Um, so on one's about the consent, of course. They didn't kill anyone, but you see there's a pretty clear effect on the hemoglobin resulting in venous action. So that established be total certainty that cobalt did this. Cobalt is not a metabolic poison, so this distinguished the system from what was believed to be possibly responsible for the organisation of the body and is responsible, metabolic sensing, that's a different thing. This established that this was different, likely, uh, from metabolic sensing, because it's not a metabolic poisoning, and cyanide does, or, or, or other mitochondrial toxins do not have that effect. In parallel, there was this beautiful data showing the rise in EPO, which you make when you donate a unit of blood, just sufficient to replenish the blood that you've donated. And those findings led um, uh, to my interest and, and others in trying to move from EPO to oxygen. And, and, and that was a good time to start because the EPO gene had been cloned. So... Um, there had been a big history of trying to work this system out for, for decades in, in the mid-20th century. But now the EPO gene was cloned. Uh, we, we thought um, uh, we, we had a toehold on it. Um, it was necessary, though, to, to find a cellular model to, to do the molecular approach. And this is what we first attempted to do by expressing an oncogene, that T antigen, within the mouse EPO gene. And this is a transgenic mouse experiment, um, which uh, established that these cells, these are kidney tubules, for those who, who know about kidneys, these are the cells in between them, uh, the interstitial fibroblasts. Now, so I'm a nephrologist. The, the kidney has all sorts of really interesting cells. It has the glomerulus, does filtration, it has the tubules, there they are, has the macrophage, it has the endothelium. All, all of these cells have been proposed to make EPO, um, actually with the exception of the one that actually does it, the fibroblast, the most boring, least specialised, least exciting cell of the whole lot. And uh, that's going to be a theme that's coming up in, in this talk, quite, quite how wrong people can usually be when they, when they speculate. But it should have been a clue. Um, but um, although this experiment identified the cells, it, it failed in that our intention was to make them grow out, get them into tissue culture using that oncogene T antigen. But that, that didn't work. Um, Fortunately for the field, and, and this has not, I think, been properly credited, uh, Franklin Bunn in Harvard worked out that some hepatoma lines, the liver, the liver also makes EPO, would make erythropoietin in tissue culture when the oxygen atmosphere was lowered. And we used, uh, and Greg Semenza, uh, my co-recipient, used Frank's hepatoma cell uh, to transfer the EPO, gene, EPO genes into that cell, artificial EPO genes, and uh, cut and paste and find out which bit was responsible for connecting the gene to the oxygen sensing apparatus. See this bit in black at the three prime end? That's the bit that when coupled to this alpha globin reporter gene that isn't ordinarily induced by oxygen uh, confers the oxygen uh, property on it. So, so that was the first step in the journey. Uh, perhaps not surprising, these cells make EPO, so there would be a control sequence, but it, it, it was the first rung on the ladder, so to speak. Now, um, the question was how to go further from that, and I, I knew that my biochemical skills were poor. I'm a physician, as you heard, not a biochemist by training. So I wanted to take a shortcut. I, I wanted to do an expression cloning experiment. That's where you, you, you take the genes from one cell or organism, transfer them to another cell or organism, transfer <coughs> the property, and hence the genes are inferred to encode the property. Uh, very clever and I, I admire. So that's what we wanted to do, transfer from, from Frank's cells uh, that had the property to, to one that didn't. That's practically all other cells, we thought. Um, but in doing the control experiments, this is what we eventually found, that uh, all the cells had, had, had the property, whether they came from uh, e e EPO or, or from EPO-producing or, 
uh, organs or, or, or not. These were skin fibroblasts and things, nothing to do with the, with the kid, kidney that made EPO. So it was a little bit irritating at the first. It destroyed our strategy, but of course we worked out after a little while that this had enormous significance. We weren't looking just for the regular to, of EPO, which had been believed to be private to these things. This was a general system, and it must have other purposes. I, I don't know, my, my children... So the, the work is, it was trouble to publish. Um, some people said, uh, well, we don't believe you. It can't possibly be true. Everyone knows that EPO comes from the kidney, so this is just... Uh, <laughs> crackers and, and uh, uh, we, some ways we've done something wrong. Uh, and uh, other people said, well, you know, this transcription factor, they often work generically and uh, that yours doesn't really surprise to us. And uh, of course, either way was a, a problem for the editor and a sadness for me. Um, and my, some, people, some people might have seen the rejection letter which circulated <laughs> after one of these parties and my kids picked up. If it comes your way, there is one interesting thing. It's the usual thing, more suitable for a specialist journal and not of general importance, da da da. Um, it says, uh, apologies for the delay in, in response, particularly as we're unable to expect, uh, publish a paper. We were unable to find reviewers. <laughs> now, think about it. If anyone ever says that to you, it means you're in a new field. So the combination of having something that's probably important and people being unable to find reviewers means you've, you've broken out into your own field. Um, the, the, the guy running the institute where I work, Sir David Weatherall, David was so fantastic to us all that when everything, anything like this it happened to you, rejection, the thing to do was get in his office and manifest some obvious loss of personal control and stay there until he'd done something about it, which he, he duly did, and the paper uh, eventually appeared in the proceedings of the National Academy of science of the USA. But uh, that opened the field for us. Uh, Greg Semenza identified HIF and later cloned HIF, which is the bit that stuck, the protein that stuck to that sequence. Uh, and uh, successively, it's become clear that this system uh, works on, on, on many of those other things I showed you, energy metabolism, which saw in the liver before, angiogenesis, capillary density, uh, things that are a little bit obtuse but probably support oxygen homeostasis, things that might be more reparative, and then all sorts of new properties that we, we never thought of as being regulated by oxygen, the immune system, inflammatory pathways. We're still not sure, and I, I, I'll come to this, whether, whether this really is a new physiology of oxygen, which, which, which is was not anticipated at all, or, or whether these are just add-ons. Darwinian evolution uses whatever it can find for whatever it wants, and we'll, we'll come to that. It, it, some people don't believe in Darwinian evolution. I, I believe most people don't understand it. At least they don't understand the scale of the implications that, uh, that come from that. We'll we, we come to that later. But, but this opened the field. The, the question was what lay upstream of HIF, which, which uh, uh, Greg Semenza uh, not only identified but also cloned. So this is an experiment of ours trying to find which bit of HIF, now we've gone from the control element to HIF, we want to go again up to the oxygen sensor, which bit was responsible for oxygen sensing. If we thought we could narrow the bit down, then that would tell us where to go. And this is an example of just pasting that, that uh, bit of the protein onto an artificial transcription factor. This bit here confers regulation. This one does, but these don't. There's the regulation by cobalt as well. I also knew by this time that iron chelators would do that. Another clue that this was quite distinct from, from metabolism. So uh, that's what those experiments, we laborious, we went through that and they found that there were three regions that would do this, and, and, and they, of course, had to interact with the oxygen sensing system. So that, that was the next bit of the journey. Uh, of course, um, everyone knew, uh, knows that uh, protein phosphorylation, uh, kinase, phosphatase, cascades, there regulate signal transduction. 
So everyone was looking for a phosphorylation system that would link the oxygen sensor to residues, which had to be in one or other of the, well, had to be in all of the domains. They all did it in isolation. And um, we, we went through this. We, we um, mutated every phosphoacceptor in that region, made no difference at all. Uh, and that, as you can imagine, was also a tricky one to publish. Um, People said, well, this is, this is all negative results. I, mean, someone, I think one of the reviewers even suggested we might be overfunded to do so many <laughs> negative experiments. But, you, you know, it, it, it did change thinking because it did exclude the mainstream mechanism. So these negative things are sometimes important. But we didn't, uh, at that time, know where to go. And, and the, the next clue uh, uh, came uh, from uh, one of the co-recipients, uh, William Kalin and also Rick Klausner, who, who noticed uh, that the kidney cancer, which has, is mutated for this tumour suppressor, the von Hippel-Lindau, uh, appears to have some abnormality of hypoxia regulation since at least in the familial form, you, you get the association with overgrowth of blood vessels. It's a retinal photograph uh, in, in, the, in the retina. Uh, and, and the tumour itself is highly vascular and, and sometimes is associated with excessive red cell production. So, so there seemed to be a, a hypoxic connection and, and they saw some of the genes we'd identified, the, uh, mRNAs were upregulated in, in these VHL defective cells. Um, we, we made the connection to HIF, uh, and here is the, this is one of these eureka moments where someone shows you a blot that is without doubt telling a story. Uh, and, and this is one made by Patrick Maxwell, and uh, here in the VHL negative uh, cells. Uh, you see that, that HIF isn't much regulated by oxygen. When we put VHL uh, back in, um, then there's this enormous regulation. So you, 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 we were pretty lucky here. You could ask why, you know, since this connection was first made in, in Harvard, it's, it's not a bad medical school, it's not uncompetitive either, why they didn't clean up. Um, the answer is that... Um, uh, we had made antibodies, and this is a lesson. If you were going to lead a field, you were going to have to make your own antibodies <laughs> because the, these are the reagents that we use to, to, to understand our system, and if you have to wait for Santa Cruz to market it, then, of course, all these, all these hungry people will get there first. So we, we made antibodies, and that's the second lesson, that you, you need to be prepared to do that. Um, <coughs> Now, uh, VHL uh, had been, uh, the structure suggested that it was a ubiquitin ligase, a, 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 a protein that's involved in the tagging of ubiquitin to proteins to target them for destruction. And, and that was what we eventually worked out, that um, uh, in the presence of oxygen, uh, VHL would bind to HIF, uh, so that was... That was the implication of the blot you've just seen. In the absence of oxygen, that, that um, didn't happen, so the HIF was not destroyed. It built up uh, uh, and it uh, mediated that transcriptional response, which we uh, talked about being so extensive. So the question was now, what is it that, that controls that interaction? And uh, this is, of course, a classic biochemistry uh, experiment. You, you could treat the peptide with cell extract and uh, measure the interaction between these proteins. And that's, that's what we did. Um, as I said, I'm not a biochemist, and um, we modelled through this in, in, in a quite a disorganised way. Uh, we, we found that it was heat labile that suggested enzyme needed oxygen, needed iron, didn't need ATP. That, that was consistent with the protein phosphorylation not being relevant. Though we didn't do it terribly efficiently, and this is again the thing, how, how did we claw our way through that? Well, as I said, we, we sort of burst into a new field, so it, it wasn't, it, it, we would have been easily outcompeted by, by uh, the competent biochemistry labs in the world, but we, we had a bit of a lead, and, and that's what we found. 
we, we could mutate the HIF peptide, here it is, and we noticed that um, this, is, this is a capture of HIF by VHL, pull down VHL, see whether the HIF will come with it. And uh, 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 as you see, this uh, mutation of this proline uh, completely uh, uh, ablates the capture. So it seemed there was something likely about that. Uh, you, you can perform mass spectrometry of that peptide, so you measure the mass uh, before or after treatment with, a, with an extract. Uh, and and we, we noticed, or we could dis eventually discern that there was a, there was a 32 shift on, on this peptide uh, whereas on, 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 the, on the Y11, there, there was only a 16 shift, so it's 16 different. That's, of course, the atomic weight of oxygen, and that implied oxidation on proline. Those of you who know a bit about mass spec, well, no, this is a really tricky technique. You get a lot of artifactual ox oxidation, and uh, it doesn't really prove the matter at all. So the, the, the key experiment we, we wanted to consolidate, we, we made uh, a synthetic peptide with, with the hydroxyproline, that's the oxygen atom added. And of course, you know, it's a bit of a saga, the peptide, well, I ordered it too long, so it was difficult for the firm to make it, that delayed it for a number of weeks, and then you know, it was again delayed in the post or something, and, but eventually it came, uh, uh, and this is, um, this is the result, that when you've done that, you, you didn't need to treat, that's the, the ordinary one, need to treat it with an extract. Black and white result again, and that one, uh, this is a Sunday morning experiment, uh, which, which I always describe, that means a postdoc rang me at home with a result on Sunday morning. <laughs> uh, a result, you know, just, you wake up. Uh, and that's a bit unusual. It implies the work was done on, on Saturday, right? That, don't everyone's lab work on Saturdays. Um, it implies that the result, there was an expected result. So someone went in to read it on Sunday morning. That's uh, even more unusual. Uh, but what is really unusual is, is the result. It's positive. I mean, usually these things, it's an awful moment. They're negative, and people come in on Monday morning to tell you the dreadful news. But that was positive, and it was important because it implied immediately a, a system uh, for oxygen sensing, which, in fact, we all should have guessed was a likely possibility uh, ages ago, uh, because the the known collagen hydroxyl, prolyl hydroxylase, prolyl hydroxylase, structural modification of collagen are oxygen-splitting enzymes. So, and what's more, they're known to be inhibited by cobalt. So they had all the right properties. We knew we weren't looking for a collagen hydroxylase. We were looking for a different type that would take this HIF substrate and, and that uh, put on the oxygen atom, uh, targeted for uh, ubiquitulation uh, 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 and hence for proteolysis. Um, so then the question was, what is the enzyme? And again, we, we didn't have the greatest biochemical skills. And uh, I had the extreme good fortune to meet with this guy, uh, Christopher Schofield, who um, had solved the structure of, of a number of enzymes of this class, not the collagen hydroxylases, but enzymes that were known to use 2-oxaglutrate and have this particular iron coordination uh, uh, system and he, he, Chris used those properties to look across the human genome which uh, uh, was mainly uh, understood by this time and, and could predict um, a number of, of, of possibilities that uh, might be the oxygenase um, and that combination again with antibodies uh, enabled us to shortcut and get the enzyme. So this is a picture of C. elegans worms. They're, they're, uh, as far as the UK goes, they're not an animal. They're not a, a regulated under the Home Office Scientific Procedures Act. Um, and the community is extraordinarily well organised, so w we didn't need to... We didn't know anything about how to use them, uh, and um, we, you can buy them in the post. You can set... set send off to the C. elegans database, they send you the mutant worms. And uh, we, we had made an antibody to the C. elegans HIF, and here is the normal behaviour of that protein. In worms, simply put in a bell jar and made hypoxic. 
Uh, and here is Chris's, one of Chris's suggestions, Hegel 9. Uh, you can see, again, one of those eureka moments, not a hint of regulation. So the implication was, since the enzyme was dead, uh, it was mimicking low oxygen, and uh, that uh, w w must be the, the uh, oxygen sensor that we were looking for. It was important since uh, the C. elegans has just one enzyme, the human beings have three, uh, so there was no, there was no redundancy and, and the genetic mutant was, was absolutely clear in, in what it told us. So that's the story. Um, I want to do a couple of other things, but... Uh, just to recap, uh, that's about 12 years' work, 14 years' work. There were only two real steps. <laughs> uh, there was a regulatory oxygenase. That, that, that uh, enzyme uh, has a high KMO2, a low oxygen affinity, uh, and the reaction is highly oxygen-regulated. It creates it, it converts proline into hydroxyproline. There's the oxygen atom. This alcohol group, hydrogen bonds uh, to residues in the floor of a pocket in VHL. And that is the switch that regulates your blood cell production, your blood vessel growth, your metabolism, uh, whether cells differentiate or not differentiate, whether they survive hypoxia, they migrate, or, or, or all the, the, the uh, hundreds or thousands of genes that, that we uh, showed earlier. So, um, in the end, um, We'd all written reviews about what the oxygen sensor was, like we'd all written reviews about what cells in the kidney produce EPO. Um, the, they were all wrong. The cleverer and more erudite the reviewer, um, the more wrong they were. <laughs> uh, and if you looked at uh, the, 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 everything except the right answer had been proposed, a reasonable conclusion would be we were trying to confuse each other and put each other off the, the, the scent. There's only... Uh, so why is uh, biology so confusing? Well, this is an important point. What, what, why, at least for us, it's so difficult? So this is HIF. It's a basic helix, helix pass protein, uh, and then it has this degradation domain and, and an activation domain that I've, I've just showed you. So if we take those domains, the basic helix, loop helix, that's in all eukaryotes, yeast, plants, animals. The past domain uh, is in, in prokaryotes as well. It generally produces sensory functions, including the sensing of oxygen in bacteria. So how could it be that the past domain was not the oxygen sensor in uh, eukaryotic cells? But it isn't. I've just shown you that. What is an oxygen sensor is an enzyme which, again, is present in non-animal species as well as animal species. And that's the one that hydroxylates this. And then there's another one on the end, which I haven't shown you, a different type of oxyglutrate oxygenase that also assists in the regulation of HIF. So this is the way you're built. You're pasted together from bits. You're Baroque. You're, you're not, you, you, you are fit for purpose, but, but you're not an efficient way of doing what you do. That's often confusion between maximum parsimony, which is a mathematical term, I understand, <laughs> and Darwinian fitness, which is nothing to do with maximum parsimony, which is why it's also confusing. So if I may, um, uh, I'm aware of sensitivity uh, with Europe at the moment. I'll just illustrate this by reference to the European motorway system. You drive on the continent, some of you, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, if you're in Germany, um, you're on the autobahn. The Stuttgart is, is to the right. The sat-nav says Stuttgart to the right. Uh, the sign says to the right. You take the right-hand turn. You go to Stuttgart, right? It, 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 it is worth thinking about it. You're going to get to Stuttgart on the autobahn. Now, this is, this is not uh, the autobahn. This is not Germany. In fact, do people know where this is? This, we, we, 
we have the good fortune to have a house on the Côte d'Azur. Um, so this is a French motorway um, uh, moving from Nice here to, towards Cannes. Now, people say, well, the French have, have better things to do than build motorways, you know, um, particularly in the south. Um, so this is what happens if you want to go to Juan le Tan, which, which is where our house is down here. You'll exit the motorway here, and you go here, you go around one of these roundabouts, probably around the other, up in, into the hill, that round again, down, under the motorway, over the motorway, <coughs> under the motorway, over the motorway, and then you get to Juan le Tan. Some of you will have had that experience if you've driven in the south of France. It, <laughs> it is, it is it, you know, you're sat, and that's not going to work. It, it's going to be difficult to read the map. Uh, and you are not going to succeed uh, by thinking about it. It's going to be uh, trial and error, mainly error in the first place. <laughs> so what is the reason? What is the reason why the German motorway and the French motorway are different? Uh, and this is how you are built. It's because the French, at least in the south, have constructed roads from cobbling together bits of existing road whereas the autobahn is made by engineers from scratch and it, it's fit for purpose. Uh, as Francois Jacob uh, correctly put it, uh, nature is a tinkerer, not an engineer. Uh, and this type of process means it's extremely difficult to unpick you or, or as we'll allude to, make drugs or do anything intelligent at all in biology. It, it, it is not helpful and may be a hindrance to be very clever to do this sort of thing. Anyway, I'd like to move on and show a little bit more um, about the system and, and then we'll close with, with drug design. So, so this is Christoph Lennartz. He a, was a, a very able PhD student in Christopher Schofield's lab. And, and Christoph has lined up all, all, the, all the enzymes and the HIFs across all the animals. And, and, and what it shows here is that at the base of vertebrate evolution, uh, there were gene duplications, so we've all, higher animals have, have, have more of these things. Now, we're anxious to understand the system, to take it apart and to make drugs, uh, and to understand physiology. Uh, these higher animals, the vertebrates and ultimately the uh, mammals and the humans, have specialised delivery systems uh, to uh, regulate oxygen, to, to bring oxygen to the body, the lungs, the heart, the breathing control and all that. So the question was, would, would, um, uh, would there be particular isoforms of this that have particular jobs? We'll just look at that data a little bit, but I, I, I want to go um, start this again with Haldane. This was another figure, this was not Fitzgerald, this was Haldane himself, in the comfort of the hotel with the other men. And... Um, what they were interested in was, was what happened. People knew you breathed heavily at altitude. It, it was thought that that was due to acid and, and the idea that it was actually the low oxygen was, was <coughs> attributed, that the low oxygen produced lactic acid and, and, and that was the stimulus to breathing. So they wanted to observe one of two possibilities. Either that would continue or it would go back to normal when the kidneys excreted the acid. So they, they anticipated that after the carbon dioxide going down, as you breathe harder and harder, it would then go back up, uh, and, and, and they would know whether the, the, the kidneys would correct it. But look what happened. It, it, in fact, it carried on going down. And, and this is an interesting thing in publication. They, they did not say, well, <laughs> that's a difficult result. It will cause trouble with the referees. We'll save that for another day or anything like that. There's a whole uh, page of uh, this phenomenon was observed in myself, in Douglas, in whatever the other people on the expedition were. We all had the same uh, effect. Uh, and I do not understand how this could happen at all, broadly speaking, is what they put. That's uh, 108 years ago. Uh, it came, uh, it, it is in fact the phenomenon of acclimatization, which Peter Robbins here in physiology uh, demonstrated was due to uh, an increase in sensitivity to acute hypoxia, which develops uh, over 
hours or days, days in this case at altitude. So you make a very rapid response to breathing a hypoxic atmosphere. You make it in a few minutes or possibly a few seconds, but then your sensitivity increases as you've been up at Everest Base Camp or, or whatever. Uh, we wanted to test the effect of HIF on that, and we, we model this in the mouse. This is a mouse in a plethysmus graph, and this is the effect that you see in the mouse. That's a normal one, an ordinary one, and that's one that's been pre-exposed to hypoxia. It makes a huge difference to... So we asked the question, since HIF can't be responsible for breathing control, it's too rapid, is there an interface? Uh, uh, and the answer is, um, yes, there is, and it's highly specific to this HIF-2 isoform. You see, if we knock out HIF-1, these are recombinant mice. Broadly speaking, the adaptive response is the same, whereas it's completely ablated in the HIF-2 mouse. That's mRNA, and in the carotid body here, you have this enormous amount of HIF-2. HIF Looking at inactivation in the oxygen-sensing cells in the carotid body, you see this huge effect of knockout of HIV-2. And if you look at the uh, carotid body type 1 cells, the <coughs> sensitive cells down with an electron microscope, you see that this response, their secretory, their neurosecretory cells, this response that they ordinarily make to hypoxia, get these big eccentric vesicles, <coughs> is completely lost in the knockout animal. So I'll just show that to... to Spend a bit of history, uh, and to the, this is the transcription system we've we've described isn't the end of oxygen sensing, but it does interface with with it's beautifully interfaced. Not only complicated itself, but it's beautifully connected with other systems to deliver that critical uh, uh, need of, of of exact time monitored oxygen homeostasis. So. Uh, specific isoforms of HIF do have discrete physiological functions, in this case the breathing control for HIF-2, and we, they interface with other processes, and clearly HIF can't explain all aspects of human oxygen homeostasis. So, um, more recently, um, we've been interested in, in whether there might be uh, other systems that, uh, that, um, that we could study, um, they're important for, for the physiological knowledge, but, but also since hypoxic disease is common, they, they, they may make good uh, medical targets. Um, and um, since, since we described that system in animals, it's become clear that all four eukaryotic kingdoms, animals, protists, plants, uh, yeast, fungi, all, all use different types of pro enzymatic protein oxidation coupled to degradation to signal oxygen levels. Seems a very inefficient way of going about things, uh, but that's the way it is. We, we don't fully understand why. Um, so these are animals and protists. We, I've just shown you this one, modification of the transcription factor, hypoxia-inducible factor, to make it associate with the, the destroyer, ubiquitin ligase. In, in, in protists, it's the ligase that's modified and, and that's involved in, in uh, switching of different types of behaviour in dictostelium. Um, we, we've been interested in this one, that yeast uh, employ a, a different enzyme, a prolyl. This is a prolyl 4 hydroxylase. This, this uh, oxidises uh, one of the other uh, uh, carbon atoms, the, 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 the three... Um, in the ring, uh, and in, in fungi, that's involved in the sterol response. Cholesterol is an oxygenated molecule, needs a lot of oxygen for synthesis, and uh, that's regulated uh, strongly by yeast. And there's a human enzyme, which I have to say, studying over the last eight years, we, we still have not worked it out. The plants, however, um, very interesting, they use a different type of thing, cysteine oxidation, uh, and that, 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 to, that, that's to regulate the destruction of transcription factors, which in plants are ethylene response factors that are responsive to this. Uh, they have a, 
uh, uh, in residue. Two, they have the cysteine. So methionine is first removed. That exposes the cysteine, and, and, and that's a, a regulatory principle in, in plants. So it's just chance encounters that move you on in life. And I, 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 ha, ha, I was asked to do a meeting in, in, in Rome. I almost <laughs> cancelled it because I had to go and pick up the last Oscar Award. If you get these things, you do have to go. But in the end, uh, my secretary arranged a nice, neat air flight that could just do it. And I, talk, I gave the first talk, and then a guy called Francesco Licosi uh, gave a second talk. Francesco had worked on the plant system. I wanted to rush off, but I just caught him at the end of the lecture. He said, could I have some of the plasmids that you've made to express in plant cells? I want to see how the plant, how the animal system works in, in plant cells. So a very good work, Francesco, we'll send you those. I wonder, perhaps we should take some of the plant things and see if they work in animal cells. And, that, you know, and then we dashed out and caught the aeroplane, or I did. Um, and um, so this was what we found, that th this was a bit of DNA from a plant fused to a reporter gene and put into an animal cell. And that's the regulation by, by oxygen in, 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 in the uh, animal cell. So it was there. And furthermore, when we mutated that system, it didn't work at all. Um, that led to the prediction that there was an animal enzyme that was orthologous to the plants. And um, this is an experiment uh, that I really like because I'm not a plant biologist uh, of Francesco's. This is the plant which is deprived of its oxygen sensor. Uh, plants uh, get hypoxic in floods, but when the <coughs> oxygen sensor is, is, is taken, they, they go into a constitutive uh, hypoxic. Uh, gene expression program and they don't like it, so you get this weary little plant. When you put the human enzyme back in to complement it, it grows very nicely. I love that experiment, because I know nothing about plants, but and that wasn't my experiment. Uh, but that, of course, established that the system is orthologous, there is another oxygen sensor working through that protein oxidation. Uh, uh, and this is one done by Tom Keeley in the lab, showing that when you knock out the human enzyme, it has an effect on, on this target, which is ordinarily regulated uh, by oxygen, but isn't in the knockout. That target is a regulator of G-protein signaling, and here is the effect of the knockout on G-proteins. G-proteins are the transducers of many drug effects, and we're working... Uh, with Norman Masson, who did this, and Tom, to try to understand the interface. In this case, with a more rapid oxygen sensing system in animal cells. So, um, just to summarize then, we, we, we've got this one. Uh, this is the first system I showed you, hif prolyl hydroxylases. I put in five or six arrows, but I could have put in five or six hundred. It, it regulates a massive cascade of, of, uh, of transcription responses. In the plants, uh, we, we have this other system that is similarly organized through uh, protein oxidation uh, and is similarly uh, the transcription factors, which are these ethylene response factors, have a, a lot of targets. Um, uh, uh, but then we found um, that um, the plant system has the orthologue in animal cells uh, on uh, working on G-protein signaling, which of course have many, many effects in animal cells. And then we found one more, or rather it was pointed out to us, uh, that these things are not only targeted for destruction by this system, they are also transcription targets of HIF. Each one of these is hundreds or thousands of arrows. So, in the face of all that, how could you ever make a drug? We started with EPO, we found the system, and now people want to switch on EPO, which is a market of 10 billion a year, so it's worth doing if you can do it with a better drug. Um, if you'd asked the field at the start, could you, the, I mean, these enzymes are eminently druggable. The, the 2-oxaglutarate is a co-substrate. Uh, you can make an analog, so it is a medicinal chemist's paradise. There's a template to make so 
would, it, would you be able to treat anemia, given all the complexity that I've shown on this slide? And the answer must have been, you're joking. You, you can't do this. Now, you'll, it'll have some other horrendous effect. As though that was 2001, uh, we're 18 years down the line, what's the status? So I missed one out there. Um, that, that, the, these are all the things that we, we uh, you know, could do. And that, as I say, that's the question. With these drugs, that, that is the, the drug uh, in the pocket. That's the oxaglutrate analogue. There are other drugs that break it. How, how could you do just one private thing with, with, with all this biology? Well, these are the results in the clinical trials of... Um, Drugs are now marketed in China. We're expecting the phase three trials in Europe and the US quite shortly. Uh, they're different companies, but on each case, I won't go into the detail, you're, you're seeing a rise in haemoglobin when you give an oxyglutrate analogue to inhibit these enzymes without, as, as far as can be seen, many other effects on the body. So quite surprisingly. And... Um, I say it, it, it's very difficult, given this complexity, to predict how you would ever make a drug. Um, but in the famous words, you can't always get what you want, but if you try, sometimes you get what you need. Who, who, who wrote those, who, who sang those words? Sir Michael Jagger, yeah, that's right. Um, he knew it a little bit, at least by repute, about drug discovery. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> That, 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 so there is an, this is an important point. People will talk about precision medicine, that molecular biology will deliver this. I do not believe that's correct. Uh, molecular biology will deliver, as I've shown you, I hope, a target. There is then an element of empiricism, like the journey from Nice to Juan Le Pan, uh, where trial and error is important. In this case, it looks as if it will be positive. Now, I, I can give you post hoc all sorts of reasons for that. The, the drugs are concentrated in the, in the liver and kidney, so you know, maybe that's why they specifically or relatively specifically make EPO. Uh, the, the drugs don't hit that that other enzyme I talked about, the, the one on the, on the end of the HIF gene, and EPO is, is not much affected by that enzyme, but to be honest, the data is not very convincing. Um, that first slide, the, the little uh, production of red cells after, to, to, to compensate blood transfusion, red cell life spans 100 days, so if you just flick a few out with a, with a little dose of the drug, then you could integrate pharmacodynamically uh, and, and perhaps by dose spacing get what you want. Um, the kidney has this beautiful countercurrent system and in the normal setting, uh, if you, you, you're just like you and I here, we're just making EPO, just down at the corticobadolary junction, right, right in the inside of the kidney. As you become more anemic, you switch on all, all, all these cells. So these cells are amplifying the signal. When you give a drug, of course, it might be agnostic to that gradient, so it can immediately switch the whole lot on. What happens in a diseased kidney, probably disorganised, won't perhaps not seeing the oxygen levels properly. Again, the drug might be able to reach all the parts and switch it all on. So... It's possible that the, uh, this is an amplifier making the EPO gene specifically sensitive. So if HIF's regulated tenfold in any one cell, uh, the amplitude becomes a hundredfold. So the, the, the drug has more to work on, that might be the explanation. It might be that in the diseased kidney you have more of those fibroblasts, although they don't make it normally, their potential to make it is higher. All, all these, and, and, and there's actually some evidence for that in, in dialysis patients, this is the response that they, they, they make, actually higher than the control group. So it could be that there are hyper-responsive kidney patients. So I could write a beautiful review about that, the extraordinary intelligence with which I've predicted that these drugs would be safe after all, and it would be possible to make uh, uh, EPO in a relatively private way. But it would be a lie, 
we're all good at writing these beautiful reviews, but uh, we tend to gloss over things a bit. And the truth is that this wouldn't be predicted, and it's an extraordinary testimony to the braveness of the industrial guys who put the money in, a lot of money, to do this uh, in order to treat um, the anemia of renal disease. I'll, I'll stop there. This, this is my group on a, on a sunny day. I, I've had the wonderful support of all sorts of people, uh, particularly this guy, Chris Pugh, who's been with me pretty well from the outset and uh, who've been very grateful recently for the Ludwig Cancer Research. Welcome Trust have funded me uh, throughout. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for a great talk and congratulations for the Nobel Prize. Uh, I just would like to ask um, animals that survived in low oxygen, like a subterranean mammal, like mole rats, yeah. or animals that live uh, underwater, how would this response be in terms of those animals? Will their uh, genes be constitutionally expressed in those, or they have a different sort of hypoxia maintenance mechanism? It's a very good question. Uh, we, we, we don't really know the answer. The, the um, trichoplax, HIF uh, enzyme, which is the most ba basal animal, seems to work in human cells. So unlike the adaptation of hemoglobin, uh, I don't think the enzyme is specialised. I, I, I suspect that they have, they have more HIF targets or, or there's, a, there's a sort of physiological reason ra rather than a basic biochemical reason. But we don't absolutely know that. That's a good question. Hi, Mr. Radcliffe. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a more general question. You mentioned uh, you're a physician scientist, and I'm interested in how you approach in balancing those two roles and um, whether it's more difficult to find time to do science as a physician and any advice you would give for anyone who's interested in becoming a um, Sure. Well, well, it was sort of important, and as I said, it was a new question. To, to be, what, what we had to do as clinicians who wanted to, to get on, not in science but in anything, we, 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 were, we had to write case reports. People said, well, if you're an alive clinician, you'll, you'll see the patients and you'll describe the diseases. That was an extremely useful skill, actually. It's much denigrated, but it taught me to look across an array of possibilities and decide which were the ones from which I could draw conclusions. That training doesn't arise in science, but it is true in medicine. I, I think that was, was important. Now, now, the ward is busy, and it will be difficult to do this sort of stuff as you're, you're running a ward. I trained sequentially. I was 35 when I started this project. I'd already trained clinically. I had my specialist training in nephrology. And actually, for me, that was a very good time to go into science because I got my clinical ticket. I, I didn't have to fulfill any numbers requirements or, or, or anything. So I, I don't know whether that would work for you or for people now, but that's what happened to me. It was sequential, not at the same time. Thank you very much. Yeah.